All right, so now we're joined by David Toledo, who's running for City Council District 5. So go ahead with a two-minute introduction. Um, great. Uh, my name is David Toledo, and again, I'm running for City Council District 5. My uh, story uh, in North Seattle begins over 40 years ago when my father uh, retired from the U.S. Navy and moved our family just a few blocks north of North Seattle Community College. A few years later, my um, parents unfortunately split up and my mother was left raising four children on her own. So she, uh, in order to find activities for us to do on such a limited income, we spent a lot of time uh, at the parks. Uh, Green Lake uh, and Bitter Lake uh, were two of our favorites. A few years later, she remarried and um, uh, once she was able to get a little more stability in her life, uh, she wanted to give back to the community. So in 1978, she began a soup kitchen out of the uh, Liftonwood um, apartments on Greenwood. A few years later, she actually started one of the first North End food banks from the uh, front porch of our home. So that's my history in the area. Uh, as for myself, um, I am a, um, a OPEIU uh, eight union member. I've been with Seattle Housing Authority for the past eight years. I uh, was an elected PCO in uh, the 34th district. Um, ten years ago, in addition to holding down a full-time job, I helped found the Unified Outreach Nonprofit Youth Arts Program, where we work with at-risk youth. Um, <coughs> we provide volunteers to elder care centers, transitional housing centers, uh, and uh, really wherever there's a need in the community. Uh, again, I'm running for District 5. Um, I hope you will consider endorsing me, and I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So now we have our four prepared questions, and they're actually right in front of you if you want to turn it over and read along as we say them aloud. Um, these are two-minute answers, and Clayton, will you start with number one? Seattle is experiencing a housing affordability crisis. Several policy responses have been suggested, including linkage fees, incentive zoning, subsidized housing, and rent control, among others. What is your approach to keeping Seattle affordable? Great. So, um, again, I've worked for Seattle Housing Authority for the past eight years. I'm very well versed uh, in the uh, affordable housing authority, uh, for, I'm sorry, affordable housing conversation. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, just uh, over a month ago, I actually published an article, The Affordable Housing Conversation, that everyone can understand. Uh, the problem that we run into when we're talking about affordable housing is everybody's talking about different things. Some are talking about subsidies, some are talking about upzoning, some are talking about microhousing. Um, my approach is that I want to discuss everything and I want to hear all the ideas. Uh, last year, Seattle Housing Authority put forward their Step Forward program. Um, it was unfortunately shouted down by, or shouted down at the uh, town halls. Um, some say that, uh, that, that the shout downs were encouraged by current city council members. Um, one thing I would bring to the city council is I'm going to have an open ear to, to solving the problems. I like the idea of upzoning, um, especially in the uh, Lake Union area. Um, however, I feel that we need to look at all of the codes, uh, zoning codes. If you're familiar with uh, Cindy's House of Pancakes off of 105th and Aurora, or well, it used, where it used to be, there's currently an apartment building there that's a mixed usage. And unfortunately, the area that's designated for business is not being used. Uh, it's just not appropriate for that area. If we could look at those zoning uh, ordinances and see what we can do to uh, free up some of those um, apartments that are mixed use for uh, affordable housing, uh, that would be a good start. Again, I'm open to uh, upzoning. Um, I like the idea of uh, the city using city bonds to build their own housing uh, and um, I think that's a good start as well. Uh, so once again, I'm uh, very versed in affordable housing and I would encourage everybody to go online and look at the affordable housing conversation. Everyone can understand our article. Thank you. Uh, John, number two. Okay. <clears throat> Last year, voters approved a levy to fund a universal preschool pilot program. After the pilot concludes, how would you fund the full implementation of the program? And what policy changes would you make to assure this plan addresses educational disparities in our city. So in addition to um, universal preschool, which I fully support, I'm very big on strength-based education for elementary school. 
Um, I would like to, uh, in addition to advocating that we renew the levy, I would also uh, be looking at working with the Department of Neighborhoods and possibly working in partnerships uh, where some of those funds are able to um, cross over so that uh, preschool and other early learning uh, programs are supported. Uh, that would be the first things that I would look at. Um, uh, otherwise, I think that it's uh, uh, crucial that we do build community partnerships with uh, other nonprofits um, in order to bring um, uh, affordable, pre uh, pre affordable preschool <laughs> to the area. So thank you. I apologize. I'm not a professional speaker. <laughs> you will, I'm sure, have your fill of them as the interviews go on. So um, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Michael, number three. Bertha is still stuck. What options does the City of Seattle have with respect to potential cost overruns, the waterfront, transit, and an unsafe viaduct? Yeah, pull the plug on that. Um, I think that um, uh, I was a pretty large uh, voice of opposition against the tunnel. Um, I, uh, I think we need to, to really look at stopping um, as soon as we can on putting any more uh, good money after bad. Um, our city council members knew that the, um, um, the people that we were contracting for the tunnel had a history of lawsuits um, of uncompleted projects and uh, basically um, milking the, uh, the partners and the cities that they worked with out of millions of dollars. We should have never moved forward with that project. So I say we pull the plug on it, we start looking at other uh, ways of transportation. Uh, light rail, obviously, is uh, something we need to be looking at. Um, uh, bus systems, uh, sustainable, viable um, busing. Um, we can't always go to the taxpayer. Uh, the uh, 250 and now $275 uh, on peak uh, trips for commuters um, is not something that, um, that the average commuter can afford. Um, so we need to look at ways of uh, either subsidizing uh, bus trips or um, entering into, again, new partnerships where um, linkage fees, where community partners, developers, whatever the situation is, is paying into that fund so that the uh, city um, can move our people uh, quickly, efficiently, and affordably. Okay. Mary, number four. Um, yeah, I apologize. I think I might have started you with 130 instead of 2, did I? Oh. Um, did you notice? It's, it's <laughs> Anyhow, fine. I gave you a long one. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure I did that. Uh, number four, Seattle is the fastest growing big city in the country. Should we encourage or discourage this growth in what policy changes are necessary to accommodate the growth? Sure. Well, uh, I believe that we want to definitely encourage growth. Um, I think that we've sort of boxed ourselves in with our idea of um, um, uh, what is affordable housing within the city limits. Um, and the fact of the matter is that a lot of people that work in Seattle actually commute in. They come from the surrounding areas, Edmonds, they come from across the bridge. So these are all people that funnel in and then funnel out. So when we say, well, we need affordable housing and we have to only look at limiting it to the city limits, um, I think that that does us a, disser a disservice. Uh, so I think we need to work with our um, communities, uh, rural areas just outside of the borders, um, crossing over into shoreline, um, what, what sort of um, relationships and partnerships can we have with them where um, that housing opens up to people again that work in the Seattle area. Uh, but again, I don't believe that we uh, should put any limits on growth. Um, I believe that we just need to find affordable, responsible ways to grow the city, to work with uh, small businesses to make sure that they are growing, uh, that they're sustainable, and that uh, uh, people are employed, uh, especially the people that live in our cities. Um, I am a big fan of the idea of um, uh, businesses receiving perks, possibly tax breaks, for hiring, uh, priority hiring for people that live in their area. Um, so that's one thing I would like to look at. And uh, again, just uh, making sure that our transportation, that our roadways um, are able to, to get our people from A to B um, in an um, expedient, uh, safe amount of time. Last month we saw the fish truck turn over and shut down the city. It reminded me of when we had a snowstorm a few years ago and it took uh, eight hours to get from downtown to North Seattle. Now imagine if we have a terrorist attack or a major earthquake. We can't keep uh, doing road diets, 
um, doing uh, road thinning, doing these things without looking at the big picture. I'm all for supporting uh, bike lanes and bike paths, but let's be responsible when it comes to the big picture. Thank you. Great. So now we'll open up to follow-up questions. Uh, these are one-minute answers. Jana? So you talked a little bit in your housing um, section about the new development where Cindy's Pancakes was and um, the mixed-use zoning there. Part of that zoning is human services. The DFC has a, a, a housing for um, very, very vulnerable clients there. What's um, your solution for the fact that there's really a dearth of social services in the north, um, north end and northwest sector? There's very few senior services available in the Lake City area, and there's very little family support services or connected, even connected nutritional programs in the Northwest sector. So what's your uh, ideas for solving that issue? Right, so um, North Seattle is what's considered an aging community. Um, and so social services are definitely something that we, we need to, to keep an eye on, uh, along with our public safety there. Uh, growing up in the area, and again, I've been there for over 40 years, um, there were uh, policemen in the communities constantly. Um, when I would walk by the uh, North Precinct, you would see police out of the parking lot socializing. You would, uh, if you were to go in the lobby, you would see them there. So um, public safety is a big issue, and that ties into taking care of our seniors and our social services. Now, as far as funding goes, yes, we need to have hubs there that are easy to access and easy to get to, transportation that, that gets there quickly. Um, we need to fund that, um, again, with uh, alternate yet sustainable sources of income. We need to cut the waste that we have in government right now and put those funds towards things that are crucial, such as health services, especially for our seniors, veterans, and disabled. Clayton, and then Mary. Um, I'd like to, to, um, to, to join your remarks. Uh, regarding question three, um, the the uh, tunnel project, um, it's in the following way, um, uh, it took eight years to reach the decision to build a tunnel. Uh, any alternative to the tunnel will take a, no a number, a huge amount of time for a decision to be reached as to what that is. Along the way, we will continue to have um, transportation blockages on I-5. Uh, my question is whether or not your stance with respect to, to given all that, uh, whether your stance with respect to question three is in fact viable. Uh, well, I uh, for the people of the city in sure. terms of getting getting around. Sure. Seven mile block up today. Sure. Yeah, and I've been in those. Uh, sitting in that traffic more than on more than one occasion. Um, I just think um, that there wasn't due diligence done on the tunnel idea. Now you say it took eight years for the tunnel idea, for the for us to move forward on the tunnel idea. The idea of the tunnel and the uh, partnership developments didn't start eight years ago. It was a pretty quick process once they the idea was put forward for the tunnel and they received the engineering plans. So yes, pulling the plug on it is going to hurt. But moving forward and throwing more money into this bad program, which we don't know will ever really be a viable uh, form of transportation, um, I can't support that. Um, I know that uh, we will have other candidates that will come in and, and will waffle on the issue. Um, I don't. I don't support the tunnel. I never have. Uh, so whether we're talking about a, a surface route, whether we're talking about um, reinforcing um, the viaduct, and uh, or rebuilding it. Those are ideas that I'm willing to look at. I'm willing to look at just about anything. Uh, I believe in good dialogue and good ideas. I'm open to bringing everyone to the table, but the um, tunnel situation, I don't feel that that was an honest program from the beginning. Um, I may have just not heard you right. Um, you said something in discussing preschool about strength-based education, and I'm not sure what you mean. And since that might be kind of short, if you could also comment on the role of a city council member vis-a-vis -vis public education. Sure. So strength-based education is, is uh, um, where you basically 
uh, tailor classes at the um, kindergarten through first grade uh, or even preschool through, uh, I mean fifth grade, uh, to work with the, what the kids, how they learn best. So if you have kids that learn math by using the arts, then that's what you do. You bring in music programs, you bring in, and that's where I talk about partnering with the Department of Neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So I want to really be focused on that. Now, as education expands and you get into high school, um, we're running into issues with the Common Core situation. Mm -hmm. uh, again, City Council doesn't have a direct uh, voice on whether or not Common Core is followed or not, but I think that we can uh, make our opinions known. Um, mm -hmm. I think there are other alternative sources, um, uh, standards, uh, that we can use it, uh, as opposed to the Common Core. So I don't support Common Core. I would um, uh, be a voice against it uh, on the mm -hmm. City Council uh, to the best of my ability and my position. Uh, so I have one. So um, Honest Election of Seattle is currently collecting signatures to put um, Initiative 122 on the ballot, uh, which would create a uh, voucher system of public financing of campaigns. Um, I'm curious, have you um, signed that initiative? Do you support it? And how do you think it would affect uh, campaigns in Seattle? Right. So um, I haven't signed uh, on off it. Uh, I, haven't, I have not signed it yet. Um, I've looked at it, and I'm not the type of person that waffles, so I don't want this to be, I'm not sure, maybe I will, I don't need to put my finger in the air. The fact of the matter is that giving voters that don't vote the ability to uh, have $100 to put into a campaign doesn't necessarily mean that they are going to vote. So that's, the, what I want to know is I want to know what sort of studies have been done, um, is this really something that we want to get behind, or are the people that m the money is going to be going to that actually use those vouchers going to be the same people that are already in the political process as it is? So is it just going to be money from the same people that are already active, or is it going to be a way that we bring new voters in? If it's a way that's proven that it's going to bring new voters in, then I would support it, because I think you'll get new, fresh voices running for office. But if it, that money is going to go to support the same um, machine politicians, that are running now and getting thousands and thousands of dollars, tens of thousands, the day after they declare, then I don't feel that we need to put that burden on our taxpayers. Okay, thank you. We have time for a couple more questions. People have them. Clayton. Um, <clears throat> you used just now an interesting phrase, I thought. Um, you used the phrase machine politicians. Um, I'd like to know um, what machine you're talking about <laughs> and what politicians you're talking about and sure. precisely what you mean yeah, sure. by that phrase in our city. Sure. Well, I think that there are uh, some major players that have a lot of money that they put into politics in the area. I don't think I need to name names. I think we know them and I think they're on both sides of the aisle. So when I say machine politics, I'm talking about politics where you have somebody that's encouraged to run and that money is available available to them again the same day that they declare so again if we're talking about bringing in uh, new voices new fresh voices that represent the neighborhoods then that's something i support but i don't want taxpayers paying for the same people that we've seen time and time again or that have um, that are related to politicians, or there's a nepotism going on, or worked in the office of a certain council member. Hopefully that explains more. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about what exactly you did with the SHA, and from what I read about the Step Forward program, they set up a system where people had to get a higher paying job without giving them much help in doing that. Right. So I, I'm kind of surprised that you um, right. favored it apparently and I'm, you said. Yeah, and I'm thankful that you uh, brought this up because there was a lot of information on the program so I won't say, I'm not saying that I favored the program, what I'm saying mm -hmm. is I favored dialogue and I mm -hmm. think that people should have been coming in and been able to state their case without being shouted down I see. so what I know about the Step 4 program and, and I'll, so again I've been with the Seattle Housing Authority for 8 years as a certification mm -hmm. specialist and with a property manager mm -hmm. so I work directly with the, the clients so the program, and again, I, this wasn't something I was a part of other than just working at Santa Housing, but as I understand it, is that there's a STEP program that once you've been on this program uh, for seven years and you've sort of topped out with what you're going to pay, you would still be paying less than you would uh, 
uh, holding a minimum wage job. Mm -hmm. So that was left out of the equation. So yes, there were steps that you would go from the minimum right now, which is $50 a month if you're not working, step every year. At seven years, it tops out. But again, if you hold a part-time minimum wage job, you are able to afford the highest step. So again, it wasn't talked about, wasn't discussed, and I just think that we need to have ears open and honest dialogue because we have to save the affordable housing that we currently have mm -hmm. before we talk about finding new sources. Great. So we're about out of time. If you want to take 30 seconds for a closing statement. Great. Um, so again, um, I appreciate uh, that you're considering endorsing me. Um, again, the district races have given us a chance to have new fresh voices and I feel that I'm one of those. I'm 40 years in the area, I understand the area and the needs of the area, and if you went to either of the past two forums, you know that I was the only one breaking away from um, the other candidates and talking about things like cleaning up Green Lake. Okay? I'm the only one that says the infrastructure issue uh, and the problem with our sewage pumps failing on a regular basis and pumping that raw sewage into the lake. I was the only one that addressed that issue because I'm from the area, I know the problems that are here without having to have a consultant come in and say, here's what people are talking about. Please consider endorsing me for Seattle City Council District 5. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you.